because of what Christ has done for us. Now let me footnote and say that I understand, and that is human nature and emotions. There's days where we are happy, and there's days that we're not happy, and I get that. And I'm talking about a constant state. And you know the type of person that there's always something negative. There's always something unpleasant. There's always something to complain about. There's always something negative to look at. And it's sad if that person is a child of God. Jesus didn't come to earth and live and die and raise on the third day for us to live a life like that. That's not why He came. That's not what it's about. That's not what Christianity is about whatsoever. How can Christians remain unhappy? How is that? Paul says to be joyful and always. Again, I say rejoice. He was able to say that while confined in a prison in the first century. Much different than prisons in the 21st century in the Western world. But yet he's still to say, rejoice in the Lord always. Notice the rejoicement is not in your happenings. Your rejoicement is not in what, it's sunny and it's nice out, therefore I can smile. No, the rejoicing is in the Lord. It's in who we have. And Paul really, really strikes a nerve with all of us that, that am I... If I really examine myself, and let me ask you the question, are you, overall, are you a happy person? And if so, is your happiness because of your faith in Jesus Christ? Or do we, if we're really honest and we really look at ourselves, maybe I, I wonder what do I, what do I convey to people? Do I convey that maybe Maybe they look upon me and they, and they see me. They may not reach the same conclusion. Then I'm a happy person. Not because of what's happening to me, but because, as Paul says, in the Lord. Oh, Paul, in Romans 5, if you do have the case of the blues, if you do get down on yourself, if you do think, woe is me, illness, and you have a case, a bad case of that, my... Suggestion, read Romans 5 and underline the phrase, much more, much more. In verse 9 of Romans 5, Paul says, much more, underline it mentally, much more, having now been justified, we're made right by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. We didn't have much of a we didn't have much of a chance when it came to the wrath of God, not on our own merit. It was a bad case scenario. Not much chance for us. But now we've been made right by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are saved, much more saved. We are have better than good odds. Because of what Jesus has done. How much more happy should we be because we have been spared from the wrath of God because of what Jesus has done for us. We've been made right. We've been justified by His blood. Look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more... Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I love the imagery that Paul has given us here. Because he's building on what he just said earlier in verse 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If God, if through, through Jesus, if we were able to be reconciled back to God when we were enemies with God, to be reconciled is to restore our friendship back with God. How much more now, because through Jesus we are now saved. Or much more than reconciled to God, we are now children of God because of Jesus Christ. What a tremendous transition from us as people, from enemies 
with the one person you don't want to be an enemy with. Forget about countries and leaders. Focus on the Creator and the sustainer of life itself. You do not want to be an enemy with God. But through Jesus, we're much more than that. We're much more than reconciled. We are saved. I mean, those two alone is enough for us to put a smile in our hearts, shouldn't they? Those two are enough to help us when we're feeling the case of the blues in life because of the happenings to us that cause us to forget who we are and what we have. But Paul goes on and talk about more. Look at verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense, but if the one man's offense many died, how much more the grace of God. The gift of the grace of one man through Adam all have sinned. Through Jesus much more. Grace abounds. Through the life of one individual, Jesus Christ. All this much more is connected to the one factor. The chance that we have, the better than a good chance, in Jesus Christ. The last one that I want to share is in verse 17. For by the one man's offense, death reigned to the one. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, will reign in life to the one, Jesus Christ. Yes, through sin of mankind, death plagued the world, but, but how much more we receive through Jesus the life, the true life. What a powerful set of passages that Paul gives us. The much more life in Christ should lead us, should result in all of us living blessed beyond measure. We have so much more. We have so much more because of Jesus. We have so much more because of our relationship in Christ Jesus. We have this because of what Christ did for us. We should live in happiness. We should be blessed. We should know that it's not... Our odds in favor with God are so much more better because of what Christ has done. Living a saved life. Living a life that leads us to everlasting happiness. Let's consider a little bit more specifically just what we have that will help us in the first part of Romans chapter 5 that builds the case of this much more in the relationship with Jesus Christ. Number one is this. We have peace with God. In verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you just focus on this passage and think about Philippians 4, verse Verse 7, where it says, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's not the same peace that Paul is talking about here in verse 1 of Romans chapter 5. Notice a different phrase. In Romans 5, 1, you have peace with God. In Philippians, you have the peace of God. To explain that and to help bring that into a better picture, you've got to have peace with God first before you can have the peace of God. And the reason why you have to have peace with God first is because where we stand in contradiction to God. The peace with God, and the, the best imagery that I can give you is, think about the white flag. When you think about wartime and one side and the other side, when the white flag is raised, what does that mean? We surrender. We're, stop fighting. Let's, let's come to a conclusion. Let's, let's draw a peace. Let's no, let no shots, more, more shots be fired. It's a peace treaty that we have now with God. That in our relationship with God, it is, it is with the God that this war that we have that we've been fighting in the life of sin, in the flesh, that we're, we're tired of fighting. We're tired of going against something that, 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 that we're never going to win. It's, it's, 
It's like the hamster in the wheel. We keep spinning and spinning, getting the same results, which is insanity, spiritually speaking. We are justified by faith in Christ, which allows us to be at peace with God. Romans 12, verse 19 says, As much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all people. As it depends on you. If some person chooses not to be at peace with you, that's on that person. That's not on you. But you better be at peace with God. You better be at peace with God before your final breath. And you can't have the peace of God unless you have peace with God first. Stop fighting. God, I surrender all. I surrender. What a powerful, what a powerful hymn to remind us of what this peace of, with God refers to. Now, once we have peace with God through what? By our faith through whom? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one that gives us this access to God in such a way. Then we can understand more what Paul is saying in Philippians 4 verse 7. We now can have peace of God. Calm in the middle of the storm. Everything is happening at you, but yet you, you're, you're, you're fine. You're at, you have a, a, a sense of tranquility about you, a calmness. Maybe you've seen it in people. People that should be panicking, running around, worried, just, just fretting about every little detail, but they're not. I'm going to be okay. God's in, God has this. That's the peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace that God gives us because of who we are. The peace that, that is provided to us, that gives us a satisfied heart in the midst and the presence of trouble. It is very subjective in our sense of who we are and where we are at in life. And that peace of God is in context to the cares and the troubles of this world. It's, it's beyond what you can understand. It's beyond your, our comprehension. Trying to rationalize and trying to think about beyond human intellect, well, that's not going to happen. It's beyond these things. It's not dependent upon everything being right in the world. It's not based on what is happening to you presently in your life. It's what God gives us. It's much more than an emotional satisfaction knowing our relationship with God is right. It's part of that is the gift of the Spirit, which part of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. And the comfort that we receive. We have this peace, this peace we have access to because of Jesus Christ. That that peace was made at the cross for our sake. So that we, not Him, so that we could have much more. Now let me ask you. As we go through life and we go through this and that and we face this and, and this. It's easy to focus on that and have the tunnel vision to where we see only that thing and... It makes us upset. It puts us in a state of unhappiness. Go back and read Romans 5 verses 1 and see the peace that we've made with God. You're no longer at war with God. Isn't that a good thing? It should be. You don't want to be at war with God. You'll lose every time. You have peace that we're justified by faith through Jesus Christ. And that results to something that's much more. We have peace. Peace is something that is priceless. Peace is something that people would pay anything for when they're in trouble. They'd give anything to have peace. But peace can't be bought. Not true peace. Peace must be obtained first by us getting our life right with God first and then receiving what is beyond our comprehension of God. Second. The second thing that I want to share with you is this. We have access into His grace. Look at verse 2 
of Romans chapter 5. He goes on to say, Through Him we have access by faith into His grace, which we stand. Boy, I love the imagery here. To have access means you are brought closer to something. You're being introduced to something. We have access to where we're able to stand. What that means is we now can engage into a closer personal relationship with God. Do you have that? Have you worked on that? We have relationships in life and that we know those relationships require effort on our part. It requires us doing something to build that relationship up. Well, why would a relationship with God be any different? It doesn't happen by us just sitting on a pew and, God, I want, want your goodness to happen to me. Just, just strike me. Hit me. No, we have access. We build this personal relationship and we should build upon this personal relationship to where we're able to stand in a place that we have no reason to be standing because of who we once were. But through Christ, we have complete forgiveness. That we can stand in the presence and in the closeness of a holy God. That's the access of grace that we have because of Jesus and through our faith. We're able to have favorable position before the Almighty God. Think about what we're saying here, folks. This, what we're talking about tonight does not apply to everyone. What Paul is saying in Romans 5 doesn't apply to every single person on this planet. It only, it, it only pertains to people have got it right with God. What, who, he's, who He's speaking to is Christians. What, what this applies to is those who are children of God. This is not John 3, verse 16, where God so loved the world, it applies to everyone. This is for God's people who have, who have tapped in the access of His grace, who have peace with God through their faith in Christ Jesus. We stand, we stand firmly. If God is for us, then we have His favor when it comes to us. Can we lose this favor? Can we lose this access that we have with grace? Yes. You'll notice what he says at the end of Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. He says in verse 17, 18, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn. Avoid them. The divisiveness that some of the brethren may have. They've, been, they've lost the access to the grace in which they were able to stand. To note them, to avoid them. For those, he says in verse 18, who, who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but they serve their own belly by smooth words, flattering speech, to see their hearts of the simple. Their God is themselves. Their God is not the true God. And a sad situation to consider among people then as well as people today who have such great standing with God, who are no longer an enemy with God, who have so much more, but yet they settle for the bicycle. They settle for the tent in the backyard. They settle for the remainder of their life eating nothing but crackers and drinking water, and yet we would look at the physicalness of their life and say, that's crazy. How much more crazy is it spiritually? To have what we have. And don't care about it. Can we... Yes, we can turn our backs. But I want you to think about this imagery. We stand in front of the presence of God in the, in the midst of His grace. The grace that is shown through His forgiveness. Complete remission of your sins. In salvation. You're saved. 
That's not partly saved. That's not halfway saved. That's not somewhat You are completely saved. That's grace, my friends. And that's a truly wonderful spiritual blessing. And again, I ask the question, how? How could a child of God who loves God, who wants to serve God, be in the habit of being unhappy? How? How can they? When they have so much more. The final thing, and then we'll close with this. We have hope. Boy, I love hope, don't you? Hope is something for us now, not for us when we're with God soon. It's for right here and right now. So is our faith. And he speaks about hope a little bit more. He says at the very end of verse 2, Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. We glory in tribulation? Yes. Because it's not about our happenings. It's about the condition of who we are. Because we know the tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and this character, hope. Hope does not disappoint. Not biblical hope. Worldly hope, yes. Not biblically hope. The love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who He has given to us. Biblical hope is synonymous for conviction, certainty, expectation. We use, water it down. I hope tomorrow is a beautiful day like today. Well, that's fine, but that's not really what hope is because that's wishing, wanting. That's not expecting. That's not certainty. It's the anchor of our soul. It's, it's the expectation of things that we do not see. In fact, Paul would say in a few chapters later, Romans 8, 24, if you see it, it's not hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. We hope in the things that we do not see. I haven't seen Jesus, have you? I haven't seen the Holy Spirit, have you? I haven't seen the Father. I haven't seen paradise. I haven't seen the place which Jesus has gone to prepare. Have you? I know it's there. I know they exist. I hope. I expect. It's certainty. This hope does not disappoint us. It doesn't leave us in embarrassment. It doesn't say, I fooled you. I tricked you. That's not biblical hope. It will not disappoint. And it will not disappoint because it is bounded by the love of God, which He has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, the gift that we received. God's love for us can be trusted more than any other love that we see and experience in this life. Being able to know who we are, what we're a part of, as an example of the love which God has for us. Yes, my friends, we may have a time in our life where we get down and out. We may feel sad, we may feel sorrow, we may feel like that the world is against us and we're on an island and no one understands us, and we may get that way and things may happen to us that we don't like and we want or we want. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about the next thing that's beyond your control? Next thing you have no power to, 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 to remove and get away. What are you going to do about it? You can sit in your sorrow and you can say, woe is me. But that's not what Jesus came to do. You can settle for the tent, but that's, He didn't come for us to live in the tent. He didn't come for us to ride the bike. He didn't come for us to eat only the same thing over and over. We have much more in Jesus Christ. We have peace. We have access to His grace where we can stand. 
and we have a hope a hope that we haven't seen that will not listen to me will not disappoint the devil can't take that away from us the world can't take that away from us it's only within ourselves that if we choose to take our eyes off as Peter did that we find ourselves in trouble. Maybe we need a good daily dose of Romans 5 in our lives. Maybe we need to be reminded of how much more we have compared to what it was. Maybe we've forgotten. Maybe we've gone through life and so busy about this and that that we have neglected just how much more we have all because of Jesus Christ. The invitation song has been selected carefully by Paul, and we're going to stand and sing. And if we can help you, whatever that is, the invitation is offered by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it can happen any time, any moment, but as we gather together, we want to honor that and do that. To making sure that, number one and first and foremost, we are all at peace with God. Because if we don't have peace with God, you might as well forget everything else I've just said. You've got to have your heart right with God first. You've got to put the first thing the first thing, and that is God. And that is our relationship with God, whatever that may be. You don't have to be here in person for that to happen. You don't have to be sitting on a pew for that to happen. We have technology. You can reach out. You can respond here, whatever it is. Please come as together we stand and sing.